Hi, hello. Uh, this video, uh, which I am recording now, is the third video in a series of educational content devoted to business models uh, in the media industry. Uh, those videos in that series about business models in the media industry, those videos are addressed most specifically to my students in the major of film and TV production management. Uh, those videos are supposed to serve uh, the course which I teach as fundamentals of management or introduction to management in that major. In this specific uh, video, in this specific lesson, we will focus more on the case of Netflix. Uh, in the previous two videos, I was comparing Netflix to another big media company, to Discovery Communications. So it was like comparative analysis of two different cases. Now I will focus on Netflix. I will dive a little bit more into their business model and I will compare or observe the developments of that business model over time. So first I go to the report that you have already seen uh, in those videos of mine. So the report of Netflix, the financial, the annual report of Netflix for the fiscal year 2019. Just let me see if it reads well. Okay, how does it read in the screen? Oh, it cuts a little bit. I need to make it smaller to fit into the window. Just okay, let me do it properly. Cool. So this is the report which I hope you are already somehow familiar with. So the Form 10K annual report pursuant to Section 13 or 15D of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 for the fiscal year ended December 31st, 2019. And I quickly go into the description of their business. So we are a pioneer in the delivery of streaming entertainment. It is here. Our core strategy is to grow our streaming membership business globally with the parameters of our operating margin target. Business segments effective in the fourth quarter of 2019, we operate our business as one global operating segment. And now I will jump to a two years earlier report of Netflix. So the report for 2017. And we will just check to what extent that report is uh, at, at least uh, as it comes to the description of the business, to what extent it is coherent with that report for 2019. We can just have a look at how the self-description of the business has changed over two years. So here we have, just let me make sure that it fits nicely into the window. Okay, it cuts a little bit. Okay, here. We have annual report pursuant to section 13 or 15D for the fiscal year ended December 31st, 2017. I quickly jump to the same section. So description of the business and uh, description of the business segments and we read. We are a pioneer in the internet delivery of TV shows and movies, launching our streaming service in 2017. Since this launch, we have developed an ecosystem for internet connected screens and have added increasing amounts of content that enable consumers to enjoy TV shows and movies directly on their internet connected screens. So it is essentially the same thing that we could read 
in the report for 2019, there is one difference in the description of business segments. The company has three reportable segments, domestic streaming, international streaming and domestic DVD. The domestic streaming segment derives revenues from monthly membership fees for services consisting solely of streaming content to our members of the United States, excuse me, in the United States. The international streaming segment derives revenues from monthly membership fees for services consisting solely of streaming content to our members outside the United States. And the domestic DVD segment derives revenues from monthly membership fees for services consisting solely of DVD by mail. So in 2017, they have those three different business segments. And in 2019, they went like for one single streaming segment. Obviously, they got rid of the DVD by mail segment. It was pretty much predictable because it was a relic. The interesting thing is that they stopped separating domestic streaming in the United States from international streaming. Now, a short commentary on what are business segments for those of you who are not quite familiar with that. When you run a business, sometimes you can notice that certain activities, certain customers or certain technologies are sort of different from all the rest and they could benefit from being managed separately with like a distinct separate strategy. It is frequently intuitive. Sometimes it is simple. For example, if you have content addressed exclusively to viewers in India, for example, if you have just Bollywood dramas on the one hand, and you have uh, typically American shows like sitcoms strongly rooted in the American reality, that makes like two obvious streams of content. Yet, if you go to Netflix, if you browse through that content, you can see that that distinction domestic United States versus international is not really obvious right now. So here you can see how two segments, domestic and international streaming inside Netflix, like fused into one. Okay, we go back to the Netflix's report for 2019 and we go further into studying their business model. Seasonality. Our membership growth exhibits a seasonal pattern that reflects variations when consumers buy internet-connected screens and when they tend to increase their viewing. Historically, the, fourth, uh, the first and fourth quarters, October through March, represent our greatest streaming membership growth. In addition, our membership growth can be impacted by our content release schedule and changes to pricing. Now, uh, as a commentary to all of that, an important thing. Uh, attracting new members in the streaming business means quite simply that you have to give them that free trial uh, that free trial time usually one month some streaming services go all the way up to three months so you essentially have to give to those potential customers to, so to people who just register with you but don't make any commitments to pay yet you have to give them server power. It is quite simple. When you are on your free trial with a streaming service, with, with Netflix, for example, you are just using for free their server power. And here comes like the tricky part. The more server power you give those non-paying potential customers, the more money you have to put into assuring uh, like smooth delivery of content to those already paying members. 
So the more new members, the more new customers you want to attract, the more server power you have to create and put at their disposition. Because mind you, both the potential customer who is on their trial period and the already acquired customer, they both want smooth streaming without too many of those wheels like turning in the middle of the screen and showing you that you have to wait. Hmm? Okay, okay, let's... And here comes another section of uh, a typical annual report of a company. It is the section related to risk uh, or risks in general, risk factors. We will stop a little bit by those risk factors just to see uh, how a business model can be deconstructed uh, out of those risk factors. Now, before I go more in detail into those risk factors, imagine two alternative situations. One situation, a hurricane. A hurricane is something that happens rarely, that happens unfrequently. It has the marks of a disaster. So it happens just once in a while. But when it happens, it just destroys everything. So it is a risk factor with low frequency of happening but with big magnitude of damage. On the other hand, you have risks connected, for example, to someone cheating you in business. When you do business, like on a regular basis, you will encounter a lot of people who will want to benefit somehow from your credulity, from uh, from your innocence and they will try to cheat you in business matters. So it will be like a frequent event, something that happens frequently, but when you learn how to deal with it, when you, le uh, when you learn, for example, to negotiate and sign accurate contracts, you can largely compensate it. So the magnitude of loss, if you encounter someone who is opportunistic with you, the magnitude of loss is quite small. So you have those two types of risks. Risks which are like a disaster on one hand, unfrequent but big destruction, and risks which like a recurrent pain in the ass. Very frequent but uh, marked with a relatively small magnitude of damage done. With that in mind, let's go to our risk factors of Netflix. In our efforts to attract and retain members, if our efforts to attract and retain members are not successful, our business will be adversely affected. We have experienced significant membership growth over the past several years. Our ability to continue to attract members will depend in part on our, ability, on our ability to consistently provide our members with compelling content choices, effectively market our service, as well as provide a quality experience for selecting and viewing TV series and movies. This is an important trait of uh, the Netflix's business model. There is like a whole class of business models in the management science known as business models oriented on growth. Once you build your business around a quick expansion, then even a slowdown in that expansion or a standstill in that expansion can affect you adversely. Why? Because when you grow quickly, you essentially constantly invest your capital in the things you expect to happen in the close future. You invest your money now in your expectation of growth in the future. When your expectation of growth 
become overshot, when that growth slows down or goes to a standstill, that whole mechanism sort of grinds to a halt and it hurts. Hmm? I experienced it back in the day many years ago when I was running my small business that when I had like a period of unbroken growth, we all sort of get used to that specific rhythm because growth has its requirements too. And when that growth slowed down, it hurts. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. Next risk factor. Changes in competitive offerings for entertainment video, including the potential rapid adoption of piracy-based video offerings, could adversely impact our business. The market for entertainment video is intensely competitive and subject to rapid change. Th through new and existing distribution channels, consumers have increasing options to access entertainment video. The various economic models underlying these channels include subscription, transactional, ad-supported and piracy-based models. Here comes a funny observation. Probably you know that Netflix and Amazon are like sister companies. They have the same founder, Jeff Bezos. And Netflix, uh, over years, was very largely using the servers of Amazon to at least to start and develop the early streaming services, uh, the early uh, st uh, streaming services they were supplying. But as you pro probably know too, Amazon has a separate streaming uh, streaming service of their own, which started, I think, uh, two years ago. It is, I think, Amazon Entertainment or something like that. Uh, anyway, uh, we have that strange situation when um, inside that group belonging to Jeff Bezos, there is internal competition. Okay, this is just an example of how you can deconstruct uh, a business model out of the risk factors explicitly disclosed in the annual report. Now I will go once again to that section called Selected Financial Data and I will show you something else about the business model of Netflix. So I go to Selected Financial Data and here specifically I focus on that section, on, on, on that specific subsection, Consolidated Balance Sheets. Here you have a series of years starting with 2015 here and ending with 2019 and a list of selected items from the consolidated balance sheets. In the last video devoted to business models in the media industry, in the video with the hashtag 2 number, I discussed briefly the general concept and the structure of a balance sheet. So I hope you understand it now. So uh, we can discuss a little bit freely in this case. Uh, just to, ro to remind you the general convention as for those numbers. First, uh, first of all, those numbers are in thousands. So when you read them, you need to add mentally like three zeros at the end of each of them. Uh, then the comma here is a separator of orders of magnitude. So it separates thousands from millions and millions from billions. Okay, so now um, uh, the first important distinction. Here you can see a category called the total content assets. I will try to show you in the center of your screen. Total content assets. Content assets uh, are all those pieces of content which you can find on Netflix when you use it. Each show, each documentary, each movie is a separate content asset in their business because each of those pieces of content is supposed to work like a machine to earn profit for the owner. These are content assets. And now you have a second category, content liabilities. Content liabilities. Let me 
highlighted nicely. Okay, content liabilities. When you use Netflix, you probably noticed that in some cases, when you start watching something, there is a, like a mention, a screen in the beginning, Netflix Originals or Netflix Original Production. So this is a case when Netflix financed from the beginning the production of such uh, content. Uh, so then, uh, once they make it, they don't owe anything to anyone, okay? They have no liabilities connected to that content. But if an independent producer makes a show, for example, and then sells the right to stream to Netflix, then Netflix has to pay royalties for the streaming of that content and then you have content liabilities on the part of Netflix. Good example is Aquaman, a, a relatively recent movie which started to be streamed on Netflix quite as recently. It is made by someone else, by an external producer and then it was sort of sold to Netflix or leased to Netflix for streaming. And for streaming Aquaman, they owe to external entities some royalties. So they own content liabilities. And let's see, it is interesting to see how the proportion between those two, so between content assets and content liabilities, how that proportion changes over time. For example, here, uh, at the end of 2019, you can see that content assets were being valued at 24.5 billions of dollars and content liabilities were 7.7 .7 billions of dollars. So the proportion was roughly like 1 to 3 the value of content assets were or, or was approximately three times bigger, a little bit that three times bigger than the value of content liabilities. So you can roughly assume that in terms of the actual content presented to viewers, content uh, made by external producer and not just by uh, Netflix itself, that content made by external producers represented roughly 25%, a little bit less than 25% of the total content. So right now, Netflix is based on its own productions. Let's go back to 2015. I will make that print slightly smaller. I hope that you can still see uh, because I want to have those categories highlighted here on the left, still visible. And I want the numbers on the right to be just as visible. So let's observe those two proportions. The proportions between content assets and content liabilities. You can see that at the end of 2015, those proportions were very, were very different from what they were at the end of 2019. So four years earlier, it was like a total of content assets worth of seven, well, 7.2 billions of dollars and content liabilities worth 4.8 billions of dollars. So content liabilities were like two thirds of content assets. By the end of 2015, in other words, the whole streaming business of Netflix was based mostly on externally made and externally purchased content and it was made just uh, in a smaller part, like roughly speaking one-fifth of the content, uh, maybe one-fourth, 
was the original Netflix production. So over that window of four years, from 2015 to 2019, you can see like a complete shift in you can see a complete shift in the structure of production. I just try to make it even more like a shift in the structure of content from a business model based on externally purchased content, Netflix passed to a business model focused, centered and based on uh, like in-house, internally made and produced content. Now, this phenomenon is not specific to Netflix. It is essentially visible across the board and over history. In some businesses, when you start, you find out that you have not enough potential, not enough resources inside of your business to acquire all the valuable goods that you need to run the business. And then you have to rely on external suppliers. But with time, you discover that it can benefit you to uh, like extend that value chain inside your business structure. This is what Netflix discovered. They discovered that it pays much better to be making content in-house internally instead of buying content from outside. And they progressively sort of had swallowed or and have been swallowing all that uh, industry of external production. In the vocabulary of management and economics, such a strategy is called vertical integration. When you extend the range, you extend the, the scope of value created inside your company and you rely less and less on those strategic suppliers. Okay, that would be all for today in this video. I hoped it was valuable for you. And well, have fun with science and enjoy life. Bye.